Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Hosanna Christian Fellowship. If you are joining us for church this morning uh, via our online channels for the very, very first time, we'd like you to do a couple things. Please take the opportunity to let us know where you're joining us from there in the chat box um, on our video, and make sure you take the opportunity to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'd love for you to get all the notifications anytime we have any new content of any kind on our channel, and we'd like you to take the opportunity to like this video. And the reason we encourage everybody to do that is just the way YouTube works. The more likes a video has, the more they put that video in front of people's eyes. And obviously, we want to get the Word of God in front of as many people as possible. So please take an opportunity to do that right now. And especially if you're new and joining us, I want to encourage all of you to get our church app. Our church app is a tool that we've uh, made available so that you can stay connected to Hosanna. Stay connected to your church. We have information there about our ministries. We also have the opportunity there to submit prayer requests, obviously to watch all of our um, teaching content there. And so directions to get that app are below in the video description as well as on your screen right now. And so do take a time, uh, take, a, take advantage of the time to get that app. And so Today we're doing things just a little bit different than normal, and obviously I just kind of want to deal with the elephant in the room. Uh, a lot of you know, especially those that you are normally here with us in person that are watching us online today, know that last week uh, some members of our staff here at Hosanna uh, were exposed to an individual who was positive for COVID-19. And so um, to be extra cautious, we immediately sent everybody from work home uh, we told them to uh, go get tested before any of them were able to come back to work. But um, due to that, some of our staff that we had to send home also are integral parts of our tech team here at Hosanna, as well as members of our worship team. And so in response to all of that, uh, we last week on Wednesday, our midweek service, we closed our building to the public and did an online-only service. Um, because one of our staff members is on the worship team and they were isolated and quarantined, we didn't have any worship uh, last Wednesday. And uh, we just we did that, and we're going to continue to do that. Today is online only while we wait uh, everybody's test results to come back. And so um, I am very, very happy to say that every single test we've gotten back so far, and so far, and it's actually from a majority of our staff, everybody is negative uh, for COVID. So we're very, very blessed, um, including myself, including my wonderful assistant and her husband, who are here actually uh, putting this service on this morning. And so we're just blessed. You know, we do have a couple tests we're still waiting on, and that's why we are online only today. We've also uh, shut down our youth ministries and our children's church temporarily just to be extra cautious across the board. So um, that's why we're doing things a little bit different today. But before all of that happened, uh, Pastor Gary had asked me to teach this morning um, to share with you guys so that he and his bride Denise can take the weekend away to celebrate her birthday. So that is why I'm sharing with you this morning and Pastor Gary is not here this morning. It's not because he is sick in any way, shape, or form. He's fine. He's just away for the weekend celebrating uh, his wife's birthday. And so um, just a quick couple announcements before we actually get into the content this morning. Um, as I said, there's going to be no worship. Uh, we're going to get right into the Bible study, and that will be the content for today. But since our youth and children's ministries are closed, do want to let you guys know that we have some brand new children's ministry content that will be available up at our children's ministry YouTube page. You can get that content inside of our app or get to that content from inside of our app. And then our youth ministry, our youth pastor has um, for months now actually been been producing content that we've been posting on Mondays, and that will be going up as well tomorrow. So Children's Church, content is available now. Parents, we encourage you guys to take advantage of that and be blessed by that. And then for our uh, junior high and high school students, we're going to have a, um, a devotional message from our youth leader up tomorrow. And so last but not least, since we're kind of doing things weird today and we don't have any worship today, we did want to take a quick moment to uh, encourage all of you to, to take advantage of our online opportunities for your offerings today, your giving, your tithes and offerings. You know, there's a number of different ways to do that. Technology has been real gracious in that regard to, to provide ways to be able to give uh, via online tools. You know, there's you can give by texting now. You can do that through our website. You can do that through the app. But all of that information, again, is in the uh, description below the video on our YouTube page. And so go ahead and take the opportunity while we're getting started into the, uh, into the study today to, to handle that there as well. And so with that, um, let's jump into this morning's Bible study. I'm 
blessed to share with you guys. It's always a wonderful opportunity to to share the Word of God, and we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 this morning, and what we're talking about is how to win the race, how to win the race. You know, there's a lot in human history that, that we may take for granted today as completely normal that at one time was thought absolutely impossible, right? You could think of things like airplanes, right? Um, The concept of man flying through the sky in an engineered machine was thought absolutely impossible. Now, absolutely common. Um, There was a time when light being electrically produced within a glass bulb was thought completely impossible. Now, of course, there's light bulbs and LED lights and technology everywhere for that type of thing. And there's so many other things that have happened, not just with technology and science, but accomplishments, human accomplishments, that people once thought were absolutely impossible, but because someone did it, now everybody takes it for granted that we can do it. Uh, One of those stories is the story of the four-minute mile. I don't know if you've ever heard about it, but um, running a mile in sub-four-minute time was once thought absolutely impossible. It was considered impossible for the human body of anybody to be able to run a mile in less than four minutes. Um, At the time, after it had been thousands of years of of recorded efforts, nobody had ever done it, not a single individual. And so it was thought to be absolutely impossible. But one day in 1954, a man named Roger Bannister did it. The first human to ever run a sub four minute mile. He achieved what others thought was absolutely impossible as he ran a mile in three minutes 59.4 59.4 seconds, right? Now, that was a major feat, right? Thousands of years of, of, of actual recorded athletic event and stuff, and nobody had ever done this before that anybody knew of, but he did it. Big deal. But that's not really the big deal part of the story because despite nobody being able to break the four-minute mark in hundreds of years of effort, just 46 days after Bannister broke the four-minute mile, John Landry did it, and he did it one second faster in three, uh, three hours, 50, or three hours, yeah, three hours, 59, three minutes, 59 seconds, sorry, three hours. That's a really long four-minute mile. Um, so, so yeah, he, uh, Bannister did it, and then 46 days later, someone else already did it and broke the record. Then about a year later, three other runners ran a sub four-minute mile. Ten years later, the first high school student ran a sub four-minute mile. And today, there's over 1,400 runners who have broken the four-minute mile mark. And I think the record now is down to like three minutes, 46 seconds or something like that. It's absolutely, absolutely astonishing. But the point is this. Once people knew it could be done, people started doing it, Right? Once they knew someone else had accomplished the impossible, it was no longer impossible. Now, yeah, it's still a very, very difficult thing to do, right? You know, I can't run a four-minute mile. I might be able to do the four-hour mile, possibly, but, but four-minute, you know, it's still a difficult task, but it's no longer impossible. It's no longer thought that it's beyond human capability, all because one man actually accomplished the feat. Well, For the little church that received this letter to the Hebrews that we've been studying, it was beginning to seem impossible to them to withstand the persecution that was coming against their church. It was beginning to seem impossible to them that Jesus Christ was all they needed to persevere. It was becoming or beginning to seem impossible that God could be pleased simply by faith And so they were starting to think we need to go back to our old religious traditions. And it was beginning to seem impossible that they would truly be victorious in and through their faith. And so as the writer begins to wrap up this letter to the Hebrews, having just finished giving a a list of examples in Hebrews chapter 11 on how these heroes of the faith that that the readers, the original readers of this letter were all familiar with because they were heroes of of their Jewish heritage. Really, after he'd finished giving all these examples of how they'd been victorious by faith 
in God. He's now going to apply that encouragement here in chapter 12 using a metaphor that is often used in New Testament writings. And that is the metaphor of a race, right? Um, I personally believe that Paul the Apostle is the one who wrote this letter. And one of the reasons why I think that is that he often used these metaphors of athletics, running, boxing, other things. You know, if Paul was alive today, I think he'd be one of those guys that, that would pick up the sports section or go online to read the latest sporting news and, and keep track of stuff because he seems to be real in tune with athletics, at least in the concept of it, and he used it a lot in his writings. Well, the writer here um, uses this, this metaphor of a race and really how the readers of this letter could indeed do what seemed absolutely impossible to them, how they could indeed achieve the victory by faith that God had for them, that they can indeed, without turning back to old ways, old religious habits, simply trust in Jesus Christ, and through that, they would persevere and find the victory in their, in their faith walk. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into it. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for the encouragement that your word is. God, this letter has been such a blessing as we have learned so much about the really some of the deep theological concepts of why Jesus, you, are our all in all and all we need. And God, we so appreciate the, the examples, the encouragements, the stories that we studied in Hebrews chapter 11. And Lord, we're excited to, to finish out this letter with these last handful of studies, God, really digging into the application of everything you've taught to our lives today as we run the race of faith in Jesus' name to be people in this world, to live in this world, God, victorious lives of faith, not meaning that we're always going to have what the world might consider success, but even in persecution and difficult times, God, that we would live lives that would cause you to look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. So, Lord, bless us this morning as we study your word. We're so thankful, God. We do ask, Lord, that you would bless our pastor, Pastor Gary and his wife, as they're celebrating her birthday. We pray, God, that they would just be filled with your joy and your peace and just every blessing you have for them. And, Lord, bless us today as we are gathered here to hear your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so as I said, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I want to read all three in context, and then we're going to dig back through it. And it says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. Now there's four crucial applications to achieve victory in the faith race, if you will. There's four crucial applications we're going to look at here. But the writer, before he jumps into those, he starts with a quick, quick reminder in the first part of verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, and then he goes on with his encouragements. But that's a reminder there. You know, when it says, Therefore, um, I've heard it for years from different, different teachers and pastors, and, you know, one of the concepts is when you see a therefore in Scripture— always go find out what it's there for, right? And, and that reminds us to go look back at context and stuff. And so um, we're not going to go all the way back to context, but what he's talking about is everything that I've taught up until this point, especially the examples that we looked at in chapter 11, therefore, and that's what he's referring to. He says, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now, as I said, the metaphor that's being used here is a metaphor of a race. And every single Christian believer, metaphorically, is running the race of faith, right? The whole picture of, of being in a stadium or a coliseum and on the track. And, of course, you know, referencing back to the Olympic Games. And all this stuff is, is, is what's being evoked in this imagery. But not only is every believer running the race of faith, but every believer 
is surrounded by the histories, the legacies of those that have gone before them. Every believer that has ever lived and died, their faith, their story, their legacy is what surrounds every believer today. All those people that have enjoyed great faith victories, both in times of overcoming and times of of severe persecution. But every believer that walked this true life of faith before us in the great hall of faith in chapter 11 and and from then until now, they all each wear a gold medal and, and they're winners in their own right in this race of faith. And so... The picture that's being painted here, it's not that they are right now, today, actively observing us. That, that's not what the word really means here. It's, it's, not, you know, it's not trying to create a theology or create a doctrine that you know, every saint that has gone before us is sitting up in the stands watching us and cheering us on and stuff. That's, that's not what he's talking about here. What it's saying when we have this large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, it means that their past lives, the lives they lived in faith, the victories they had bear witness to the incredible, saving, preserving faith that is being talked about and how their victories, how what faith did in their lives can be, can be accomplished in our lives. That's what he's saying here. So there's many situations where we might say, you know, you just don't understand what I'm going through and, and that's why you know, my, my, um, my compromising my faith is okay. There's a story in history of somebody who's going through what you went through and was victorious in their faith. And the witness of their faith says, if they did it, you can too. That is what he's talking about here. All these stories of faith in chapter 11. Look at all these victories. Look at what they went through. Even those who, who persevered unto death. God said that they were victorious in their faith. And if they did it, we can too. That's what he's getting at here. It's like, you know, going back to that stadium concept. You know, you look up in the stadium, and like I said, they're not actively watching us, but the concept is is their lives are watching us. And, you know, you see Moses up there stroking his beard going, yeah, you can do it. You know, and you see Rahab, you know, waving her royal princess hand and saying, you could do it, you, you can do it. And, 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 and all the patriarchs, all of them just encouraging us. Their lives are meant to do that. And I believe that's why the writer spent chapter 11 getting into all those stories. So since there is such a long line of people who by faith were victorious in their situations, that tells you that you and I can be victorious too. That we can persevere during severe persecution, that we can remain humble when great victories happen in our life and everything in between. And so after setting up the teaching that way, the writer here gets to the first application on how to win the race. Verse 1, he said, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. That concept of lay aside there, again, harkens back to the, the Greek athletes of the time. What they would do is before a race, the athletes would actually disrobe. They would be completely nude when they ran their races. And the concept was, is any type of clothing, you know, loincloth, whatever, whatever it may be, any of it would slow you down. And so they would cast off. They would lay aside all of their clothing, everything that was around them. And that's this idea here of, of casting off, but he says, let us. That phrase there means that it's a conscious decision to do so. You know, if we want to win in our race of faith, we have to make a conscious decision to obey God. Now, yes, God helps us with that and works in and through us to do that, but but you can't be in the middle of sin going, I'm deciding to sin I'm consciously doing this. I know God says no, but I'm consciously choosing to disobey him and then have the audacity to blame blame him when you're losing the race of faith. It just doesn't sim- simply doesn't work that way. You know, you, we have to make a decision and say I am going to lay aside I am going to set aside those things that are slowing me down. And the two things that he says to cast off here so that we may run the race unimpeded are hindrances and sin. And there's a difference between the two. The first one, hindrances, that word there literally means the weight 
that hinders. Other translations say, uh, lay aside every weight, right? The idea is that it's something that interferes with, delays action, um, delays progress, and the word itself in the Greek was understood as a large and weighty mass. And so that's why some translations say weight. But it's a hindrance. The idea here um, is imagine trying to run a race carrying a big boulder. You would be hindered, wouldn't you? You would be slowed down. You would be dragged back. And that's the idea here. Now, this is different from sins because not all hindrances are weights. Um, in the context of this are sinful, all right? Um, what he's talking about here is, well, simply this. What may be a hindrance to you in your faith race may not be a hindrance to the person next to you. That's what he's talking about here. You know, the concept of hindrance here is something that is, is, could be considered good or is considered just neutral, like not bad, not evil, not good. It's just, it's just a non-thing. But the weight of it slows you down in your faith race causes you to back off, causes you to get distracted in your pursuit of God and your pursuit of him. It could be a friendship. It could be an association you have with somebody. It could be an event that you go to or a place that you go to. It could be a habit you have, um, an entertainment or a pleasure you have. And again, I'm not talking about things that are sinful, like directly like, no, that's bad, but things that aren't in and of themselves bad, but for you, they slow you down. It could be a hobby that you have, that for you, it affects your faith walk, but for someone else, it doesn't at all. It could be an honor you have, or a position, or a place of authority. The idea is that if this otherwise good thing, or at least not evil thing, not bad thing, is dragging you down, slowing you down, you need to strip it away. You need to be like that runner who's getting up to the line. He says, okay, I don't want anything to slow me down. So, you know, this thing isn't bad, but it's slowing me down, so I'm going to strip it away. Now, you know what that is in your life. And I think we all have something that God might be saying, hey, this isn't bad, but it's slowing you down in your pursuit and your growth as a believer, as a Christian. And, and there's maybe a time that you're going through right now where God's been speaking to you about casting that off. And you need to listen. You need to listen to him and be obedient. You know, an example like, walking into a bar isn't in and of itself sinful. There's nothing wrong with being in a bar, right? Um, it's a, just a building, and that building happens to serve alcohol. But just walking into that building isn't in and of itself sinful or bad, but for a particular person, it might be a hindrance to them because they walk into that building and, and there's a temptation because of an old lifestyle they used to live. Maybe they were a bar hopper. You know, when I was growing up and I partied and I did my share of all that stuff before I got saved, but I was never a bar person, right? I, I never liked hanging out in bars. I didn't go to bars. That whole world, that whole environment and all that never appealed to me. And so post-salvation, when I walk into a bar, I don't have the temptations or the memories or the connections to my old life. It's, it's just a place. So there's, there's nothing sinful, and it's not a hindrance for me to walk into a bar building. But I know people who had that lifestyle. That's how they lived. They were, they were the, you know, the bar flies. And, and so just going into a bar now for them evokes all these, these memories and these challenges and the temptation, and they simply can't do it. Now, again, for that person, going into the bar isn't necessarily sinful, but it can be a hindrance to their faith and a hindrance to their growth. And so the writer here is saying, look, you want to win the race? You want to win your race of faith? Divest yourself of, cast off, lay aside, and forget those things that are impeding your spiritual growth. See, this whole section here is a very personal, individual thing, right? You know, some of us, I think, maybe um, can get too excited about wanting to help other people identify their hindrances, right? Helping other people identify their sins, and yet we don't look at our own. And we know what Jesus said about that, right? He's like, look, you know, take the forest out of your own eye before you worry about the, the speck in someone else's. You know, and so this is about saying, Lord, I want to I wanna live that life of victorious faith in you, in, in a life of, of, of 
all that I've learned about faith. And he's going, great. Start with setting aside the hindrances. And notice he didn't say just some of them. One or two of them, he said every, every hindrance. But then the next thing he says is, and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Now, sin is obvious. We know what sin is, right? Sin is, is anything that, that God is telling us not to do. It's when we're living in obedience to him and his commands and his word, right? Um, sin is when you know you shouldn't be doing something. The Bible says to, to him who it is sin, um, you know, don't do it. I'm paraphrasing. You know, if, if something is sin for you, it is sinful, and the Lord has spoken to you about it, you shouldn't be doing that thing, right? It's not something that's like, okay, this would be okay for another person. It's like, no, for everybody, this thing is, is sinful, right? Um, lying, sinful. Stealing, sinful. Adultery, sinful, right? There's no question about these things. And so he says hindrances and the sin that so easily ensnares us. So um, sin is sin, and we're all to avoid sin, Right? There isn't anything here in, in the scripture that specifically identifies the nature of the sin that so easily ensnares us, right? It, it's not you know, necessarily um, one way or the other trying to identify anything in particular as much as it is describing sin in general. However, I do believe that every single one of us have particular sins in our lives that seem to ensnare us more than they ensnare other people. I've seen that. There are things in my life that are sin, that, that, that tangle me up way faster than they seem to tangle up other people. And everybody has those things, I believe. For some people, the sin of, of stealing is just, oh my gosh, they struggle and struggle. I don't struggle with that at all, personally. It's sin for both of us, but, but there's people that struggle with it, but not for me. There's people that struggle with covetousness in a way that, that just is, is beyond, you know, sin. And for other people, they're like, I don't really covet other people's things, you know. Um, there's, there's a whole litany of things. And I do believe that, that, that people have sins that really do so easily ensnare them, possibly more than they snare, ensnare other people. It doesn't mean that it's not sin for the other person, but hopefully you understand what I'm getting at there. Um, and so, yes, it includes those, but I think it's just talking about sin in general. You know, contextually, um, some commentators uh, think or say or believe that this, the sin he's referring to here is the sin of unbelief because we've been talking about faith so much. And sure, I believe it can include that now, but um, I think it's purposely not trying to get so specific so that we don't try and figure out what sins are okay and what sins are not okay, right? Either way, sin does exactly what is described here. It ensnares. That word ensnare means to cling so closely, to beset, to obstruct, to entangle, to surround. Now, you know, there's a lot, you know, God created the universe. God created everything. You know, Jesus is the creator, sustainer of all things. And, and there's so much in nature that sometimes we could look at and see pictures within the creation that God put around us that really illustrates a lot of these spiritual truths that we learn about in his word. And one of those is uh, the picture of a sundew plant. I don't know if you've ever seen a sundew plant, but um, a sundew plant, I think, really provides a God-given picture of what he's talking about here with ensnaring from nature. Now, a sundew plant, you see the picture there. It has all these little, like, kind of glands, these little stalks or tentacles that poke out from it. And they have a, a sweet nectar that's, that's, or the flower itself has a sweet nectar that flies want to get to. But these little tentacles that are sticking out have this really sticky substance on them that's like an adhesive, a glue of some type. And what happens is a fly will land on this plant to, to get to the, the sweet nectar, right? To taste um, the, the plant there. But the problem is, is once the fly has landed, the glands slowly start to fold in on the fly. And as those glands fold in on the fly, they bend in and they touch the wings or they touch the feet and they hold the fly firmly in place. Well, the fly will struggle to get free, struggle to get off of it because it's stuck. But the more it struggles, the more hopelessly coated in this sticky substance it becomes. Now, in some cases, the fly will relax and the plant will cease to close, right? The fly will be like, oh, okay, I'm good. 
this isn't too bad. I, I'm, flies don't think, but I'm imagining this, obviously. You know, uh, I'm stuck to this plant, but hey, I'm, I'm right here close to the nectar now, right? And so the fly will then continue to, to eat of the nectar and not um, thrash so much. But as the fly is doing that, then the plant will start to slowly curl its leaves in, slowly start to curl around. And as you saw in that picture that was on the screen, eventually the plant wraps all the way around the fly and the fly is completely stuck. And then about two hours later, the plant will open up and that fly is an empty husk as it has been completely consumed by that plant, and that plant will sit there and wait for somebody else, some other fly, to come trying to find the nectar in the flower and get caught. And it's just such an interesting picture of what he's talking about here. Sin does indeed so easily ensnare us. So obviously, don't land. Don't dabble. Don't entertain sin, right? <laughs> Don't try and get close to it. Don't see how much you can, you know, dabble with without getting caught because it will ensnare you. And it will destroy you. That's what sin does. That's why God says, look, these things are sin. Don't do these things. Yeah, there's hindrances in life. That, 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 that thing in and of itself isn't bad. Some people shouldn't do it because it's a problem for you. But there are things that it's like, it doesn't matter who you are. It's sin. It will wreck your life. It will destroy you and don't even play. But instead, lay it aside, cast it off, leave it behind, move past so that you could run unimpeded as fast as you can towards victory in the Lord. Now the image is extreme, obviously, but if we're to finish well in faith, we, we have to do exactly that, strip our soul bare and, and, and get rid of every hindrance and every sin that ensnares us. And we can. And we know we can. Why? Because of the great cloud of witnesses. All of those that came before us that had their own temptations. Struggled with, with their own hindrances. And struggled with sin. And yet there are so many stories of those faithful believers who had victorious faith. Who finished their race. Who won their race. Because they had great faith in God. Yeah, they stumble at times, right? We saw that through the great hall of faith. Yeah, we stumble at times. But what God is pleased by is a faith that says, God, my, my intention is to obey you. And so I stumbled. I'm going to get up and I'm going to cast it as I can keep running. Now, he doesn't say perfection. Don't ever stumble or I will strike you down. No, he knows we're weak. And it's our fault when we look aside and trip up on something. But what God is pleased by is when we say, no, dang it, I'm sorry, God, please forgive me. And we get up and we keep running towards him. And that's really what he gets into next. Hebrews 12.1, he goes, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Run with endurance the race that lies before us. Now, notice that part of the phrase, the race that lies before us, okay? The way that's worded, um, is telling us this. Every single one of us, every single one of us as, as individual believers, we have a race course that is mapped out for us, right? Um, and everybody's race course is unique. Your faith race is different than my faith race, and it's different from the person next to me. And we each have an individual race to run in our lives with our faith and our relationship with God. Some of these race courses are seemingly straight, right? Some are all turns. Some are uphill. If you believe my grandpa, some are uphill both ways in the snow, backwards on your fingertips, right? Um, some are like flat hiking paths. Some are rocky. Some are smooth. All of them are long, but some seem longer. But the glorious thing is it doesn't matter what course you have been called to by God, every single one of us can finish the race that lies before us. Every single one of us. Now, I might not be able to finish your race, and you might not be able to finish my race, but I can, according to the promises of God's word, through faith in him, finish my race, and you can finish yours. 
And we can ultimately all experience what the Apostle Paul did when he neared his finish line in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7-8. through 8. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Right? That's, that's how I want to finish my race, with, with that attitude, being able to say that. And as long as I run my race, and I don't try to run yours, and you don't try to run mine, we'll both be victorious in our race through our faith in God. But the secret is to do it with endurance. He says, run with endurance. That word endurance there is referring to the inward fortitude necessary to keep going, right? I don't know if you've ever been a long distance runner. You know, some people were sprinters. You know, in high school, and you've heard some of my stories, I wasn't a runner at all. I was more of a a, um, field sports, pole vaulting, all that kind of stuff. And I wasn't good at that either. You know, but the point was is, what the endurance or the long distance runners knew to do is to pace themselves and, and to have a, um, that ability to push through the wall. You always hear people talk about that runner's wall, right? You're running and you get to the point where you can't do it anymore. You can't do it anymore. You can't do it anymore. You feel like you're going to die. You feel like you're going to collapse. And it's called hitting the wall. But you push through it and you get what's called the second wind, right? It's that type of inward fortitude that this word is talking about. You know, and, and the race of faith um, is like a marathon, It's a long-distance thing. It's not a sprint. You know, our walk with God is not a 100-meter dash or 100-yard dash. It's it's nothing like that. It's it's a long-distance race. It's it's meant to be something that is about one step at a time, one foot in front of the other, and keep going. It's not about getting there first because your race is for you and nobody else. You're not racing against anybody else in your race. God just wants you to finish, and he wants you to finish well. And we do that when we run it with endurance. When we have that inward fortitude that says, I'm going to keep going. Not worried about fast or slow, not worried about strong or weak, but focusing on continuing, focusing on persevering. And so you might go, okay, great. How do I do that? Right? How do I I run with endurance? Well, look at verse 2. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That's how. You see, the writer here, by using the name Jesus instead of his title, Christ, right? There's other places in the scripture when they're referring to Jesus Christ, they say the Christ, or they refer to him as Christ. Here, it's just as Jesus, right? Um, I think the author is insisting that we focus on his humanity as we um, study this, that the author doesn't so much want us to focus on his divinity, his title as the Messiah, the Savior, but he wants us to think about his humanity here as we saw it on earth. So it says, keep your eyes on Jesus. It says, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That word pioneer, I love this word. You know, in other translations, it says the source of, or the author. Um, In some places, this word is translated as champion. It's a similar word that that we looked at all the way back in Hebrews chapter 2, and I love this word because it has so many different nuances to it, but right here in, in the Christian Standard Bible, it's translated pioneer, and I think that's so important because that word pioneer means trailblazer, right? Imagine, if you will, that you were, you were in the jungle, and you needed to get to the other side of the jungle, but there was no trail, right? And so you would always have somebody who was the pioneer, the trailblazer, that kind of had the machete, and they hacked their way through the underbrush to make a way for everybody else to follow. You also think about the early pioneers in America that would you know, load up in their wagon and travel across the country as pioneers to go establish a way to a new place so that others can follow. And so I think the translation of this as pioneer is absolutely accurate, especially with this metaphor of a race. Because as the pioneer of our faith, he is the one who blazed that trail. He is the one that went into untamed lands, cleared the uncivilized, tamed it, settled it, and then made it uh, safe for us to follow. But this is how it ties into the race thing. Although, 
our course is unique for each one of us, right? My race is for me, your race is for you. Jesus, in his humanity, metaphorically has run all of our races already. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Jesus has ran every course. And he did it perfectly, and he did it without faith. I love that. And then it says he's the perfecter of our faith. That word perfecter means finisher of our faith. You know, he is the one who will bring our race of faith to completion, right? He's the one that will bring it to completion. His entire earthly life was the very embodiment of trust in God. He knows how to live a life all the way to the end by faith because he did it perfectly. It was his absolute faith in God that enabled him to go through all the mockings, the beatings, the torture, the crucifixion, the rejection by those that that loved him, the desertion by those. Um, It was his faith in God that allowed him to persevere through all of that. And so in his humanity having experienced every kind of trauma, every kind of difficulty, every trial that we possibly could endure, having already ran your course and already ran my course, he now runs with us saying, let me help you. Let me show you the way because I will make sure you get all the way to the finish line. That is such a beautiful truth. I am so encouraged knowing (laughs) that he is running with me. Every step of the course laid out for me. And I could look back on the great cloud of witnesses all throughout history and say I've seen so many who ran their race victoriously through their faith in Jesus Christ. And because they did it, I can too. Sometimes my course seems impossible. Sometimes I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, how can it be this difficult? Especially, right, when you look at the person running their race next to you, and they're like, you know, downhill on a scooter, you know, with no obstacles of any kind, and you're like, what the heck? What is going on? We get the opportunity to place our faith in him and to watch him run with us. That is the truth. That is why we are to keep our eyes on Jesus. The Greek there for that phrase means to deliberately lift our eyes from other distractions and other things and focus with utter concentration on him and who he is and to keep doing it, to continue doing it. And so not only are we just to keep our eyes on him because we know he's ran the race, we know he's been there, he did it perfectly, he knows the way, But again in verse 12, it says that we're also to keep our eyes on the attitude of Jesus. It says, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. So watch Jesus and watch how he did it. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice, he endured his race. He endured the cross. The cross was his race. His course was to go to the cross and to die for the sins of all mankind. Some sometimes mistakenly think that because Jesus was God as well as man, that the physical and the spiritual sufferings that he endured on the cross were somehow less for him that it wasn't as painful as if he was you know, just a normal man. But, but the Bible is very clear that it is exactly the opposite of that. The, the, the physical pain he endured was absolute, was horrific. The spiritual pain he endured was even greater because he was perfect. He was without sin. And the Bible says that he became sin for us. He became sin. He became wickedness and evil, and, 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 and everything that is depraved and grotesque. Everything sin is, the very, he became that so that God the Father can judge it once and for all. 
Don't ever think that Jesus didn't endure for you and for me. But he endured the cross, and then it says he despised the shame. What that means there is the the shame, the public disgrace of what was happening to him. The public disgrace of everything he went through, he despised it. That means he dismissed it as nothing. He was like, you know, the shame, the humiliation, all that, he dismissed it as nothing. Why? For the joy that lay before him. For the joy that lay before him. What was the joy that laid before him? I believe it was a few things. It was, one, the joy of knowing that he was going to complete his Father's will. He was going to do what God the Father sent him to do. I believe the joy before him, which helped him endure the cross, was that he knew that the death that he was about to suffer wasn't going to be final, that he would be resurrected from the dead. I believe it was also that he knew that as he finished this and persevered through this really, really incomprehensible trial, he knew that after it he would be exalted. Right? The Bible tells us that he was exalted to what? The right hand at the throne of God. That his enemies were made his footstool. And then and also through all of that, he got to bring many sons and daughters to glory. That means we are a part of his joy. All of that allowed him to push through and endure the course that was laid out for him. His faith in God the Father. And we know he was even tempted in that, right? In the garden. God, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, please, please let this cup pass from me. But, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. That is the obedience of faith. And when we trust God that much, when we follow the example of Jesus Christ, we will endure. We will persevere. We will find victory in the race that he's laid out for us. We're to focus on him as we run this race of faith. Throughout this entire letter, the the writer has emphasized the importance of future hope, right? We talked about that back with chapter 11, right? The Hebrews 11, 1, the very definition of faith, you know, talked about this, this future certainty that came with it, this, this dynamic certainty that, that there was, you know, faith was the, the reality, the substance of what we hope for, right? Faith was able to look into the future and say, these promises that God has given me in the future, I believe in them with such confidence that it's as if they're here with me now. And then the proof of what is not seen. That faith is the very thing that proves the truth of what God has said. I believe it so that it is real to me now. It is going to happen. It is going to be. There's this, there's this future certainty and then there's this visual certainty that we could see the invisible. That the invisible promises, the invisible future, invisible God that is around us. We know he is here. We know those promises are real. We see them as real as if they were physical to our eyes. That future hope is what the writer has been emphasizing through this whole letter. And he's been emphasizing that because his readers, the original recipients of this letter, were prone to look back and wanted to go back. But they're being encouraged, and we're being encouraged, to follow the example of Jesus Christ and to look to the future by faith, trusting in God's promises. Because when we, like Peter, take our eyes off of Jesus, that's when we start to sink. When we start to look at the storms around us rather than focusing on our Lord who can command the storms, we start to sink. But it's when we trust him by faith, his power is released in our lives. That's what it's talking about here. And then verse 3, it says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. That phrase, grow weary there, um, I was reading one thing and I said, oh, this was a phrase from, from ancient athletics in Greece, but 
If you've ever ran, I think it's a very common athletic phrase because um, running makes you grow weary, right? Um, but the idea of this growing weary here is I don't know if you've ever seen a runner, like when they're, when they're on that last, last leg of the race and their body just absolutely gives out. They're so exhausted. They, they can't even stand anymore and they collapse to the ground. That's what this phrase grow weary means. It's that runner who at the end of the race can't make it because they've just, they've lost all endurance. They can't go on anymore. Now the way for a Christian runner to avoid such spiritual collapse is says, consider him. Consider Jesus. Consider him. That word means to carefully calculate. We get our English word logarithm from this Greek word. We're to carefully calculate, carefully analyze Jesus and his endurance of, his, of the opposition that came against him to carefully analyze his opposition that came from Caiaphas and the opposition that came from Herod and the opposition that came from Pilate and others. We're to remember and focus and learn from his confidence and his meekness and his steel-like strength in meeting his enemy, enemies. The idea with all this is that we'll find victory in our race, our race of faith, when we are completely absorbed with Jesus, completely absorbed with him. And this requires casting off all those things that slow us down, aren't necessarily bad, but they slow us down. It means definitely staying away from the things that are definitely sin, casting them off, setting them aside, and forgetting them. And it means consciously focusing and meditating on him. This is why we read and reread the Gospels. This is why we study and restudy the Bible, right? Scripture is not a read it once and you're done type of thing. You know, here at Hosanna, you know, we've been founded on the principles of, of teach the whole Bible front to back. And there are seasons where we've jumped through things topically and stuff, but the general vibe has been from the beginning, and it's really the, the model that Calvary chapels have followed from the beginning is we start in Genesis 1, and we teach verse by verse all the way through to Revelation. And then when we get to the end of Revelation, well, we, we close the doors and sell the church because we're done, right? No, not at all. We go hmm, back to Genesis 1-1 and start again. Because the people we were the first time we went through it are not the same people we are the second time we go through it or the third time or the tenth time or the twentieth time. And the Word of God will always have something to teach you about faith and who God wants you to be in the moment you're in at the time you read it. And that's why we go back over it, to be totally absorbed with Jesus and who he is and what he did for us and who God is and what God wants from our lives. This is why our worship should be Christ-centric, right? Our worship leaders here at Hosanna really work hard to, to not just grab whatever worship song happens to be popular in the moment, but to, but to analyze the lyrics of those songs and say, is, is this a Christ-centric song, you know? Worship is to be about God or towards God. It's not about us. And, and there's nothing wrong with Christians singing a song about a personal experience. That's fine. But when we're looking at praise and worship, con especially congregational praise and worship, this is us singing to God. And so when we pick songs, our worship leaders spend time to say, what are these lyrics saying? It may be really popular song, but are they worship lyrics? Or is it just a really good Christian song, right? And either one's fine, but, but our worship, it should be Christ-centric, not me-focused. When we're gathering together to say, God, we're going to worship and praise you, I shouldn't sing a whole song about how wonderful I feel about it. It's okay to have moments of that in worship, sure, but that shouldn't be the focus in the center. So we read, we study, we worship with everything being Christ-centered. This is why Jesus has to be the measure of everything in our lives. He's the measure. 
Is it good? Is it bad? Should we do it? Should we not do it? Who am I? Where should I, who, who should I be? Where should I grow to? Where am I going? It's all measured by Christ. And so if you're a believer, you're in the race. Congratulations. You're in the race, okay? But here's the encouragement. Start with knowing this. You are surrounded by a great cloud of lives, of examples, who call for your absolute best in obedience and faith to the Lord. You're surrounded by the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophets. You got Moses, Elijah, Samuel, Daniel, Jeremiah, the apostles themselves, right? Peter, John, Paul, all the other apostles, the martyrs, Stephen. In history, you have Polycarp, Jim Elliot, the missionary. And then you have preachers and teachers all throughout history, Luther, Wesley, Spurgeon, Billy Graham, Chuck Smith, And then we all have our own departed family members who are great examples of faith in our lives. Those that we know that walked with the Lord. All of them, all of them are witnesses to us that we can indeed run the race and finish well. So we have to choose to cast off, to lay aside all hindrance, all sin. Whatever is hindering you, I encourage you to cast it aside. And The Christian next to you might not have to cast that thing away because it's not a hindrance for them. So sad. Just, you gotta do what's for you, right? But the sins, yeah, nobody should be hanging on to sins and letting those uh, corrupt their life. Cast those things off. We won't be victorious in our race apart from, from this radical laying aside of these things. And then we have to run with endurance, this patient perseverance we have to run the race with this, with this internal fortitude. Um, and we have to run the race that is marked out for us individually. The call that God has placed on our lives. Not trying to run someone else's right, race or trying to ignore ours altogether, but to run the race that we are called to run. To put one foot in front of the other, to refuse to quit, and to consistently keep plodding forward methodically, step by step, knowing that Jesus is running right with you and he's going to show you the way because he's already blazed that trail. We have to focus on Jesus as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He he needs to fill our entire vision. He needs to be our whole world. He needs to be the center of our sight and it will enable us and ensure us for faith's beginning, faith's middle, and faith's end in our life. And we must consider him. How he lived in the midst of everything. How he reacted. How he lived a life of perfect faith and trust in the Father despite what was happening around him. In the good times, in the bad times. And we only consider that. We only learn that. We only carefully examine that when we read and reread and study and restudy. When we worship him in spirit and truth, in the way that glorifies him and ultimately follow his example in all things. You can do it. I can do it. It may be hard. But if we keep our faith and trust in him, we will win our race and it will be glorious. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, so much for this promise, this truth May we be motivated, God, by your example to trust in you, to put our faith in you, to run this race the way you're calling us to run this race. And God, we each individually have our own race to run. But God, you do call us to run it together, and so we lock arms as your children in faith and trust in you, knowing that you are with us You are guiding us. And Lord, we thank you so much that in every single one of our lives individually, you have already blazed the trail. And you will be the finisher that you will take us all the way to the end. 
thank you so much, Lord. Thank you. God, we ask that you would just bless our lives. That you would work within us to cast aside every hindrance. To identify hindrances, Lord, if we don't know what they are yet. God, we ask that you would speak to our hearts so that we may lay those things aside for you. God, that we cast off every sin, especially those things that are especially enticing to us, Lord. Those things that seem to get us more than they get others, Lord. Help us to lay those things aside that we may run unimpeded. God, we will just we want you to be glorified. And we know that you will be. And so we trust you with our lives. We trust you with our walk. Help us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys.